Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 9711 in the name of Angus Robertson on building a new Scotland, the constitution of an independent country. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Angus Robertson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 11 minutes, please. Presiding uh, officer, um, normal countries have constitutions and they have constitutions for very good reasons. These include, of course, for constituting a state, setting out its institutions, giving them power, saying what they can and they cannot do. But it's much more than just that. A constitution is about ambition, it's about imagination, about setting out the sort of country that you aspire to be, about identifying and making real your values as a country, and about protecting and promoting people's rights. Presiding officer, a constitution reveals as much as it prescribes. It tells you what a country's priorities are. It tells you where power lies. So what we learn about the UK's priorities and where power lies from looking at its constitution. Because of course the UK has an unwritten constitution and that has only one immutable principle namely to which everything else is subservient and that is Westminster parliamentary sovereignty. It's an abstract idea, presiding officer, yes, but not abstract in its effect, and this is very real. So let me give the Chamber some examples. The Human Rights Act is one of the greatest parliamentary achievements of the last 30 years. It has delivered justice for people across the whole of British society and has ensured that public authorities can be held properly to account. Yet, it has no more protection under Westminster sovereignty than any other law. Successive UK governments have threatened to repeal protections that the citizens of other modern democracies take for granted. This Parliament's Children's Rights Bill. The Supreme Court has ruled that under the Scotland Act, it cannot even extend across all of devolved law since it affects acts passed by the UK Parliament. Laws entirely within devolved competence in areas like health and education that would impugn the sovereignty of Westminster. International law. As we saw in the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, the UK government considers itself able to seek to legislate contrary to its international obligations because Westminster sovereignty sees international law not as a celebration of common humanity or as an essential tool in rising to the challenges of the 21st century, but as a threat to its place as the ultimate source of legal authority. And even this Parliament's powers and responsibilities that we were all, regardless of our party, elected to exercise and to hold the government accountable for the use of. Nine times and counting, the UK Parliament has ignored the votes of MSPs and passed laws within or about devolved competence without our consent. So the UK's unwritten constitution reveals that its priority to be the preservation of Westminster power, and that power elsewhere is held on sufferance at Westminster's grace and favour. Of course, happy to. John Mason. I'm very grateful for the Cabinet Secretary giving way. He says the UK has an unwritten constitution. Is the reality not really that the UK has no constitution? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Uh, Presiding officer, if you were to extend the period I have to speak uh, to this uh, question, I would happily go into the highways and byways of the UK's unwritten constitution, but I see you shaking uh, your, your head. Um, I, I would suggest, presiding officer, that we can do better than the situation we currently find ourselves in in the United uh, Kingdom. I believe that in Scotland we do have aspirations and values in common and we can organise ourselves around those. I'm not talking here about the approach just of this government or even those in Scotland that support independence as our ultimate constitutional destination. I'm talking about something more fundamental and more long term, reaching across the parties in this parliament, across the people who live and work in Scotland. A belief in putting rights and equality at the heart of everything that we do. A belief in creating opportunity in a well-being economy that combines dynamism and entrepreneurship with fairness. A belief in being outward-looking as a nation, reflected in our overwhelming vote to remain in the European Union and recognising we amplify our sovereignty, not diminish it, when we work together with our international partners as a sovereign state. 
and a belief, one that certainly used to be shared on a cross-party basis, that as set out in the claim of right for Scotland, the constitutional tradition in Scotland is that it is the people here that are sovereign here. Presiding officer, this government has shown in the first paper in the Building a New Scotland series that it is in countries that identify and pursue and organise around these common aims that do the best, that are wealthier, that are happier, that are fairer. And what we have now set out in the fourth paper in that series is how we could, with independence, make real on the promise on those shared values and those common priorities. How we could put in place an ambitious interim constitution at the point of independence so that a newly independent Scotland would start benefiting from constitutional government from day one. How we could come together as a nation, how the people who live and work here could contribute through a constitutional convention to the drafting of a permanent constitution for an independent Scotland. And how a Scottish constitution could put power where it belongs in the hands of the people who live here. And that is what it means for there to be a constitutional recognition of the National Health Service in Scotland and a right to access a system of health care free at the point of need. It puts power in the hands of the people. If there were ever a government in Scotland that sought to retreat from or compromise on that principle, the constitution would empower the people to stop them. It would empower the people with the fullest range of rights and give them the tools to enforce them. We propose constitutionally embedding not just the rights in the Human Rights Act, those derived from the European Convention on Human Rights and the related protections built into the Scotland Act, but the rights in the UNCRC and all of the rights in the forthcoming uh, Scottish Human Rights Bill. And with independence, these rights would not be limited by Westminster sovereignty or by the devolution settlement. They would extend across matters devolved and matters that are currently reserved. It would not be possible for any government to simply use a majority in the Scottish Parliament to repeal those rights as it is in Westminster. These rights would belong to the people. And it should be beyond the authority of any democratically elected legislature to violate the right of the people that it serves. And we could, finally, constitutionally prohibit nuclear weapons from ever being based on Scottish soil. <clears throat> Presiding officer, who could fail to be excited by the opportunities? Who could face with the question, what sort of country would you like Scotland to be? Answer, one that organises itself around the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. And I have to say, I find it hugely encouraging that there are people beyond the independence supporting voters of Scotland who also agree. Many members in this chamber know and no doubt hold in very high regard, as I do, Baroness Kennedy, yep. one of the leading human rights lawyers and constitutional campaigners in this country. And she said, although she does not support Scotland becoming independent, if Scotland is thinking one day it is going to be independent, I happen not to be in the camp, but if that is the road that Scotland is going down, then people should be going to work on creating a written constitution for an independent Scotland, definitely. I would do it now if I were in that camp. Well, it, that camp, presiding officer, is represented by a majority in this parliament elected by the people of Scotland. And that is exactly what we are doing. We are doing what we have been asked to do uh, by the electorate, and we have published what I think is a hugely exciting document, and regardless of whether one wishes Scotland to be independent or not, imagine the future of this country where its rights, its obligations, its form is represented through a written constitution, just like pretty much every single other country in the world. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us, presiding officer. We are going to go on in future building a new Scotland, publishing a series of papers to set out what this government sees as the opportunities of independence and how we would address the challenges of becoming independent. The next paper in the series published this summer will set out what an inclusive and welcoming approach to Scottish citizenship could look like, one that would ultimately see the people of Scotland have their rights as European citizens, rights that they never voted to give up, return to them.
and future papers will go on to set out what we would do with culture, with our extraordinary marine resources, with the energy market and with Scotland retaking its place in the European Union and the wider world. But sitting behind all of them will be the propositions and the possibilities of this paper. What could Scotland look like if we had the chance and the opportunity to put its future in the people's hands? Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I can advise the Chamber there's a little bit of time in hand, so I should be able to um, give people their time back if they take interventions. With that, I call Donald Cameron to speak to and move Amendment 9711.3, around seven minutes. Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I move the amendment in my name? Now, ordinarily, I would welcome the opportunity for a robust debate, even if the subject choice is deeply questionable, but not today. Now, I'll come to the actual paper, which is the subject matter of this debate in a moment, presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer. But I have to say, it pales in comparison with what we witnessed over the weekend in Dundee, uh, which very much sets the context for this debate. We saw a first minister, or first activist, as he calls himself, announce that he wants to turn the next general election into another polarising and divisive vote on breaking up the United Kingdom. So let there be no doubt about this. The SNP have said unequivocally they want the next general election to be about independence. Page one, line one in their phrasing. The SNP will treat a victory, whatever that may be, and it is of course a word they struggle to define at the weekend, they will treat a victory as a mandate for independence. Page one, line one. Every vote for the SNP in that election will be taken as a vote for separation. Yeah. I wonder if Mr Cameron yeah, would recognise that we are perfectly entitled as a party, just as he is in his party, to lay out what our manifesto should say, and then we put it to the people, just as they will put their manifesto to the people, and in them we trust and they will decide. Yeah. Donald Cameron. I don't deny that for a second, but the point I make is that you have said, that, 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 that Jamie Hepburn has said, every vote for the SNP in that election will be taken as a vote for separation just as every vote for the Scottish Conservatives will be taken as a vote to remain in the United Kingdom. That's why what was announced in Dundee is so serious. The Can you resume your seat a second, Mr Cameron? I detect this is a debate where emotions are going to run high, but I would encourage you, please, to listen to whoever has the, the right to speak, uh, to listen to that uh, respectfully. If you want to make an intervention, get to your feet and ask for an intervention. John, Donald Cameron, I can give you the time back. Thank you, uh, Deputy Advisor. I'll, I will try and remain good-humoured uh, throughout this. But the, um, the SNP have effectively come up with a turbocharged version of Nicola Sturgeon's de facto referendum, except this time it seems the SNP has set the bar even lower by saying they don't need to win a majority of votes or even a majority of seats. They say they just need to win more seats than any other party. It's a nonsense, Deputy Presiding Officer. The SNP know the, that a majority of people in Scotland don't want another referendum in the next few years. And that's why they've come up with this desperate barrel scraping strategy, which plays to a narrow audience of nationalists and ignores the wishes of a majority of Scots. And people across Scotland will have witnessed. Uh, uh, yes, I will. Yeah. Come on, Mr. Secretary. Just, just, for the, just for the record, I think it'd be really helpful to understand what the position of the Conservative Party is on Scotland being able to determine its future. What do voters in Scotland have to do to be able to have a referendum about their future? Cab Donald Cameron. Well, people in Scotland had a referendum about their future in 2014, and they voted, they voted in that historic referendum to keep the United Kingdom together, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and people across Scotland uh, this last weekend will have witnessed uh, the events in Dundee and will be horrified, horrified, that the SNP is trying to make the future of the Union the one and only issue at the general election expected next year. Instead, people in Scotland want this government to deal with the problems that affect them in their everyday lives. That means a focus on cutting the NHS waiting list backlog and recruiting more doctors, nurses and dentists. That means a focus on narrowing the education attainment gap across all age groups, investing in additional support needs and cutting class sizes. That means a focus on supporting victims of crime and making sure criminals serve proper sentences. But no, none of these things are important to this government. They are not its top priorities. And that is a tragedy 
but it is also a scandal. Uh, let me turn to the paper, and in so doing, I do note the uh, sincere pledge given by the uh, Minister for Independence to the Nationals Holyrood Weekly Podcast, something that I listen to with great interest uh, most weeks. On the 12th of May, and he said that given government is accountable and responsible to Parliament, and that's a responsibility I take seriously, it's incumbent on me to recognise we should say to Parliament what the next subject matter, subject material of the forthcoming prospectus papers will be. Well, evidently his words were lost on the First Minister because the paper was, of course, announced with great fanfare at a press conference last week, debated in Dundee, and with just a GIQ to let MSPs know it had been published. Uh, no, I'm going to carry on. Um, now, I love talking about the law. I love talking about history. I love talking about the Constitution. But I'm not going to take the bait today. Tempted as I am to point out that devolution settlement already enshrines the European Convention on Human Rights. Acts of this Parliament, acts of Scottish ministers must, of course, comply with that convention. Because this is a paper, Deputy Presiding Officer, which argues a hypothetical of a hypothetical. It concerns an issue that is entirely academic. It is a paper that priorities, prioritises a referendum on the monarchy and the weakening of Scotland's defences. Now, how depressing is it that after 16 years of SNP rule, that is all they have to offer Scotland? We know, we have long known, that this government has run out of ideas and ambition, and today's debate is further proof of that. There is one point in the paper that I will cover as a Highlands and Islands MSP, because I take a keen interest in how this government might prioritise the region I represent. But this paper does none of that. Its proposals for island communities are glib and vague. It argues that a, that a future constitution could place a duty on the Scottish Government to take needs and unique geograph geographical character. No, I'm sorry, I don't have enough time. Um, it, takes, it says that a future constitution could place a duty on the Scottish Government to take needs and unique geographical character of island communities into consideration when it considers its function. That's precisely what the Islands Act passed last session was meant to do. Island proofing was the phrase. But rather like island proofing, this is likely to be no more than warm words. What about a right to a ferry? What about actually providing a ferry? So to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I have to say there was a moment a few months ago that I thought maybe, just maybe, a hint of realism was occurring within the SNP. Hamza Youssef himself spoke during the SNP leadership election. He said, that independence was not yet the settled will of the Scottish people. Mike Russell, the president of the SNP, saying that independence could not be secured right now. There was a moment, temporary as it was, when a realistic, honest appraisal was being made by senior figures within the SNP. That's why the announcement in Dundee showed such absence of judgment. And that's why, in launching this paper, with all its myths and theories, the SNP have completely misread the mood and temperament of people in Scotland. Now, I don't expect a nationalist to stop believing in independence any more than I expect a unionist to give up their faith in the United Kingdom. Those are views that are sincerely held, genuinely held, but I do expect them to read the room to understand what truly matters to people in Scotland right now and what they expect us as their representatives to be debating. And for all those reasons, we encourage others to back our amendment, to reject this fantasy and to focus on what the people of Scotland put us in Parliament to do. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call Neil Bibby to speak to and move Amendment 9711.2 uh, around six minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, thousands of our fellow Scots are worrying about their mortgage payments. Our junior doctors are considering three days of strike action because of low pay. And every one of our public services is creaking through a lack of investment. These are just some of the very real and pressing issues facing the people of Scotland right now. So people watching today will be wondering why Scotland's parliamentarians aren't talking about their priorities. Instead, here we are discussing a fantasy constitution for an independent Scotland that the people do not want. Why is this the most pressing topic when every other part of Scottish life, from health to education, the economy to transport, is in dire need of attention? Let us be honest. No, thank you. Not just Let us be honest and clear to anyone watching why we're having this debate today. We're having this debate today because of the SNP convention in Dundee at the weekend and the need for the SNP leadership to kid on to the grassroots that they are making progress when they aren't.
We are therefore having to indulge in an exercise in SNP internal party management, as well as a desperate attempt for the SNP to try and be relevant at the next general election. At the weekend, SNP members were asked to ignore the blue police tents, the opinion polls and other minor issues like the currency and borders, the promised referendum date in October and instead take their imagination for a walk up to the top of the hill once again. To imagine a world where Scotland is free, where everyone agrees with each other and the scary problems of the outside world daren't intrude. And while they are, while they are doing that, please don't... OK, I'll take an intervention. From Minister. I, I'm glad Mr Bibby has chosen to give way. He talks about uh, imagination. I'd like to hear what the imagination of the Labour Party is in the, uh, relation to these matters. Does the Labour Party believe fundamentally that people's rights should be set out in a codified written constitution, or do they believe in the supremacy of the philosophy of the sovereignty of Westminster Parliament at which they can be changed at the whim of a Neil, government? Neil Bibby, I can give you the time back. Well, we do, we do believe there should be a change in the government at Westminster, <laughs> and we need a Labour government to bring about the social, economic and political change that Scotland and the rest of the UK needs. And we'll be looking forward to setting our plans for the general election in the coming weeks and months. And, um, because the SNP members are being asked not to ask any hard questions and about an abysmal record in public services and a failure to make a credible case for Scottish independence which can command the support of fellow Scots. A case the Government presumably know they are failing to make. Because at the weekend, Humza Yusuf shifted the goalposts. So much so that he can apparently now achieve independence without a majority of people actually voting for it or the SNP. The previous plans for a de facto referendum lacked credibility with the public and many inside the SNP too. But the new plans are frankly ludicrous and the government benches know it. This paper isn't a game changer and the strategy hasn't been thought through. For example, a special envoy to the EU was announced at the weekend but the EU has already indicated they won't speak to them. There are a number of other many questions I could ask about the inconsistencies on thresholds that a bowling club constitutions wouldn't have and other issues, but, President Officer, doing so would be completely pointless. Because back in the real world, President Officer, this government is promising people in its document basic rights in the future, but it's failing to get the basics right for people today. Scots, Scots are no longer falling for the SNP's empty promises and just accepting what they say. We already have legislation on climate change targets and on homelessness too. But climate progress is off track and homelessness is at a high. The SNP claim they want to protect the rights of islanders, but this government can't even sort out the ferries. The SNP say they want to defend and enshrine local government, but they and the Greens have cut a combined total of £6 billion from council budgets over the last decade. And the SNP say they want to protect a right to health care, but have broken the treatment time guarantee a law they passed over half a million times. President officer, we do not need Police Scotland to tell us whether this is a government of lawbreakers. The Cabinet Secretary tells us today we need a written constitution for an independent Scotland to tackle these issues when what people need is competent government focused on their priorities. Let's contrast that with another announcement last week. President officer, while the First Minister Hamza Yusuf was unveiling his imaginary constitution for an independent Scotland, there was another political speech in Scotland. Keir Starmer, the man who most... <laughs> Keir Starmer, the man who most Scots, in fact most people across the UK, want to be our next Prime Minister, was setting out a real plan to secure our energy supply, green our economy and create jobs here in Scotland. The SNP promised and abandoned plans for a publicly owned energy company, but Labour will create a publicly owned GB energy company headquartered here in Scotland. So while the SNP manage a divided party and play fantasy politics, wasting taxpayers' cash on papers described by the Minister for Independence as campaigning tools for SNP activists, Labour is getting down to the real business. We have a plan for real change, a plan to fix the mess our country is in by tackling the everyday problems facing Scotland. President officer, the next general election won't be a de facto referendum. 
it will be a general election. The latest poll suggests Labour gaining more and more support in Scotland. Because whether you voted yes or you voted no, the Tories need to go. And while the SNP talk to themselves about themselves, we will seek to offer Scotland the economic, the social and the political change it needs. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Bibby. I now call Willie Rennie around four minutes. Mr Rennie. Uh, when, um, when Alex Salmond was sitting in the seat that um, Angus Robertson was sitting in ten years ago, you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. You could feel the anticipation on the SNP benches, the desire to get stuck into the independence referendum and to, be, to give it their credit, they built a campaign that was quite phenomenal. Um, it was quite daunting. Um, today, the more that Angus Robertson said, and I'm sure he said it several times, who could fail to be excited? I am hugely excited. I am hugely encouraged. The more he implored people to be excited, the more the backbenchers stuck into their laptops and looked at their phones. There is, there is no anticipation. There is no excitement about this. Now, I am somebody who does get excited about written constitutions, but even I haven't read this paper. I would be surprised if less than 0.0001% of the population have read this document that's been produced by the new minister. No, not just now. I'm sorry. I've only got four minutes and I've got so much to say. Um, so, so <laughs> I've not read it. No, I haven't read it. And I'm not going to read it. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to read this paper. Because this week, this week I have been dealing with constituents who are facing cuts to fire services in their constituency. I have been dealing with the victims of Professor El Jamel at Dundee who have been scarred for life by that professor because of a failed system. I've been dealing with a family who is desperate. Now, see, they're now, now they're looking at their phones. Now they're not interested. The only thing that gets them interested is the Constitution. When they face the hard reality of life that my constituents are facing, they're no longer interested anymore. That's the harsh reality. I'm dealing with people, patients in Newborough, who are about to have their NHS dentist closed. I am dealing with a family of a beaten up pupil in my constituency because of violence and behaviour in our schools. I have been dealing with a patient, sorry, a, a constituent who has been waiting for months to get their adult disability payment because now Scotland has longer waits than the DWP, the evil DWP according to the SNP. These are the harsh realities of life. It's not a written constitution for a fantasy independence campaign that nobody on these benches is at all excited about because they simply don't believe it's going to happen. We're wasting our time. Last week, we were having a debate about the Care and Justice Bill for Children. We were debating whether people should go through the children's hearing system and whether they should go to secure units rather than young offenders' institution. I had four minutes. We had a whole range of issues to discuss. Enormous, massive consequences. A good bill, potentially mismanaged, and that's why we need to spend more time on it. We were given four minutes to discuss this phenomenally important bill. Today, we've got this fantasy debate just to keep this lot united behind the First Minister, who's failing. We need to be focusing on the harsh reality that my constituents are facing and I know all of your constituents are facing as well. So let's get real. Today, today of all days, they choose to have this debate. We have got the longest delayed just charge of all time. It was supposed to have been eradicated, but of all time, they chose today to debate that. Not cancer waiting times, but they could have debated. The worst on record again. Why are we not debating those issues rather than this fantasy paper? I'd be surprised if even the back benches have read it. It's so bloody boring. Let's get focused on what matters in people's lives rather than wasting our time with this debate. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate. I call first Kevin Stewart to be followed by uh, Shan Dowie. Uh, around four minutes, uh, Mr Stewart. Uh, President officer, uh, to put it simply, uh, the UK's current constitutional arrangements are not good enough. 
There is nothing to protect our health service or workers and citizens' rights, uh, which we have seen uh, the Westminster government take advantage of uh, with creeping NHS privatisation and the ripping away of the right to strike. And it seems we will be offered nothing different from Labour. Mr Bibby has admitted so today. Sir Keir Starmer will carry on in the same old vein saying you'll have had your rights uh, and we'll keep the House of Lords to boot. Yeah. That is Labour's way too. And in terms of dealing with constituents, as Mr Rennie has just pointed out, uh, all of us are dealing with the problems of the cost of living, Brexit, uh, the Ukraine war, and of course Tory austerity, yeah. which has been driven upon us by a Westminster Parliament that is sovereign. Independence offers the people of Scotland the chance to create a permanent, modern, written constitution that puts their rights at the heart of Scotland's democracy. And in my opinion, the first line of Scotland's interim constitution should make clear that Scotland is an independent country in which the people are sovereign. Not the parliament, the people are sovereign. And the new paper, creating a, a modern constitution for an independent Scotland, sets out how people in Scotland can shape their newly independent country. It tells us how independence could radically shift where power lies, replacing Westminster sovereignty with the sovereignty of the people who live in Scotland. It explains how a written constitution could put rights and equality at its heart, including by protecting the right to strike and giving constitutional recogn recognition to the NHS in Scotland. And it lays out how a permanent written constitution could be developed by the people of Scotland and their elected parliament, giving Scotland a constitution ready to take on the challenges of the future. And I share the view of the First Minister that the Constitution should very clearly and explicitly state that Scotland should not have or host nuclear weapons. As I have stated in this Parliament before, the hundreds of billions of pounds spent on weapons of mass destruction would be much better spent on our public services and on supporting our people. Nurses, not nukes. Teachers, not trident. Bairns, not bombs. And our constitution, our constitution must be for all of the people of Scotland, enshrining human rights and, uh, and ensuring progress and aspiration. And in the last couple of decades, we have seen progress in areas such as LGBT rights, with the likes of the passing of equal marriage legislation. But we have also, in the last couple of years, seen an effort by some including by politicians, to roll back on that progress that has been made. In my opinion, these hard-won rights should be embedded in the constitution of an independent Scotland. And we need to ensure that the voices of minorities are heard in the formulation of our constitution and that we create a system that serves all. Presiding officer, the words dignity, fairness and respect are now used a great deal in this parliament by MSPs from all sides of the chamber. And I'm very proud that these three words that mean so much, dignity, fairness and respect, were first enshrined in law by an amendment that I proposed to the Scottish Welfare Fund Bill. In my op opinion, dignity, fairness and respect should be at the very heart of our constitution for an independent Scotland. For far too long, many people with physical disabilities, learning disabilities, autistic folk and those that are neurodiverse have not been listened to, to the degree that they should have been. Let's change that in our written constitution. President officer, conclude, if we Mr. do Chair. all of that, that will create a fairer, wealthier, aspirational independent Scotland that we so desperately need. Presiding officer, I hope to see all MSPs backing these proposals today, which puts the values of the people at the heart of our society. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I now call Sharon Dowie to be followed by Ruth Maguire around four minutes, Ms Dowie. Thank you, presiding officer. This parliament was set up to improve the lives of people in Scotland, to create more highly skilled jobs, generate exciting new opportunities for young people, improve public services like our NHS, our education system and our roads. We should be spending all our time on those key issues, the things that really matter to local people. 
We could be increasing the number of subjects and schools that pupils get to experience. We could be investing to improve vital roads like the A77 and A75. We could be overhauling the justice system so it puts victims first. That is the Scotland I want to build. One where victims get justice, schools provide more opportunities, motorists have good roads to travel on, vulnerable people get mental health treatment, islanders can get a ferry, and everyone can access vital NHS treatment quickly. But nothing that the SNP are talking about today will help build that better Scotland. They are not focused on those top priorities. They are only focused on their endless constitutional obsession. Mm. This debate is a total waste of everybody's time and effort. It is a disgrace to come here talking about some fantasy constitution when people in Scotland desperately need better public services now. But this shows what the SNP government has become. It is not really a government anymore. It is a constitutional campaign group, nothing more. It now exists solely to create grievances with the UK government, to divide people in Scotland and to promote division about everything else, no matter the cost. The SNP government has somehow convinced itself that a Minister for Independence is a necessity. They are now in the ridiculous position of insisting that it is good value for taxpayers to divert government resources and a team of civil servants away from frontline issues. And just look at what they announced over the weekend. The SNP have said that the next general election will be fought on the issue of independence and that every seat won by them will count towards a mandate. Hamza Yusuf has taken Nicola Sturgeon's reckless referendum plan and put it in steroids. He has decided the de facto referendum is not extreme enough. Now the SNP genuinely seem to be claiming that they will try to break away the United Kingdom if they get one more vote than any other party in Scotland. Paul McLean. We are told by both Labour and Tory politicians that this union is a voluntary union. Can I ask what route the Scottish people have right here, right now, to express their views on that? Sharon Dewey. Thank you for the question, but we already had a referendum right here, in 2014. Exactly. Right here, already right voted now. On it. And the one thing that I would say is that normally when we have debates in the chamber about things that actually matter, there's not a minister to be seen in sight. And today, mm. when we're talking about the constitution, everybody is here. So everybody's here to discuss the constitution instead of what matters. So the public health minister, I would much rather see presiding officer finding dentists. Can you resume your seat a second? I made a plea earlier in this debate that people that had the floor should be listened to with respect. The, the member has taken an intervention. She should be then listen, listened to in respect um, of her response. You do need to be concluded fairly shortly, Ms Dowdy. The ministers are all in to speak about the constitution. The public health minister, I would much rather, was looking to find the solution to why we don't have any dentists and my constituents can't get any dental appointments. Social care minister, looking for bed blocking. Why are people stuck in hospital? Community safety, if they looked at the fire and rescue, then I would be able to clear my inbox because my inbox is absolutely jam-packed full of emails from the fire and rescue service asking what's happening to cuts. And I note that I can look forward to in the summer uh, building a new Scotland series. There's a future paper coming out. I would much rather see a paper on building a new national treatment centre for Carrick Glen in Ayr that seems to have went to a standstill where the orthopaedic surgery in there would much help my constituents. Sorry. People across Scotland, even many SNP supporters, can see that this government is out of touch. You do now need to conclude, Ms Dowie. Thank you very much. I now call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Carol Mockin. Up to four minutes, Ms Maguire. Presiding officer, I welcome the publication of creating a modern constitution for an independent Scotland. The opportunity that it sets out for the people of Scotland to directly shape a new, modern and more democratic country with constitutional safeguards for democracy and human rights provides hope in what can feel like pretty desperate times, times where important values are under attack by the Westminster government. A Westminster government which has introduced laws that stripped rights of asylum seekers yeah. and other vulnerable people, yeah. encouraged voter disenfranchisement, 
limited judicial oversight of government actions and placed new draconian restrictions on the right to peaceful protest. Attacks, it should be noted, that none of the UK parties appear interested in reversing yeah. as they appeal to general election voters out with Scotland. Mm -hmm. To the opposition amendments, I suppose in summary I would say three things. Number one, democracy is not a one-off event. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Two, debate and disagreement are normal, yeah. healthy and do not have to be divisive. And politicians can take responsibility in displaying this and not fueling bad feeling yeah. and fear amongst those with different views, beliefs and aspirations. Further to that, as for not discussing theoretical plans, at first I smiled at that because I thought surely that's what all political policy ideas start out as. Yeah. But then I actually felt a bit sad for whoever wrote that. The misery of it. Goodness me, can we not raise our eyes a bit and imagine a better way of doing things? Yeah. Imagine a better Scotland. If not, I don't know what we're here for. Presiding officer, with no written constitution, the UK is an outlier. It's one of the very few countries in the world that does not have a single written document that could be called a constitution. And the issue with the series of laws, conventions and presidents that form how the UK works is that at its heart, the idea that the Westminster Parliament is sovereign, requiring a simple majority to legislate on any matter. What this means is that no matter how central any law is to our society, like a publicly owned NHS, like workers' rights, or even like devolution itself, a simple majority vote at Westminster could change or overturn that. Yeah. Now, perhaps the thought of a first line of a Scottish constitution stating Scotland is an independent country in which the people are sovereign, won't spark as much joy in those for whose sustaining the union is a priority as it does for me and others who want to see Scotland regain her independence. But I hope when we get to that point, when the people of Scotland make it clear via the ballot box that independence is the destination that they want, that all colleagues in this chamber, as Democrats, as people of principle, will see that the chance to create a permanent, modern, written constitution that puts rights at the heart of Scotland's democracy is above party politics, and they will participate fully and positively in a written constitution that the people of Scotland believe in, that has the collective authority of our nation, so that those in power accept that under the constitution they are accountable to the people. In a modern, more democratic country, surely we can all get behind that. Thank you. I call Carol Mockin to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Usually I would welcome the contents of a debate at the start of my remarks, but it is worrying and frustrating in equal measures that yet again we find ourselves debating the SNP's confusing and incoherent plans for a referendum. Plans, but by the admission of independent supporters, are at best unclear. It often seems when scrutiny of this government's performance on issues such as DRS, not at the moment, thank you, the NHS, or just general inertia becomes too prevalent, you can guarantee that the next item on the agenda will be independence. And here we go again. For many members of the public, this looks like navel-gazing during an ongoing cost-of-living crisis and an increasingly unstable geopolitical situation across the world. In fact, I think it is verging on a fantasy that this government sees discussion about a written, written constitution as a priority during these difficult times, and I would implore them to get their act together and work on things important to the communities in Scotland. Why not, not at the moment, thank you, why not use this time to, to produce a real recovery plan for the NHS that will have an immediate impact on staff morale, pay and patient capacity? or to fix lifeline services for Scotland's constantly underappreciated island communities. What about the ferries? Not at the moment, thank you. Why don't we address the crisis in local government funding in this country that is seeing many of our towns and villages without key services? Now, you will have that in your inbox. You will know that to be true. Or perhaps, most importantly of all, we can maximise assistance to the families across Scotland struggling with the surging cost of living that is rapidly eating up their pay packets. Any one of these things is of much more immediate importance than a sitting government acting like a debating society. 
looking to consider absolutely not, thank you, looking to consider hypotheticals rather than the wolf at the door. Presiding officer, this is very clearly and blatantly an attempt to play to the crowd because this First Minister is on the ropes within his own party and voters are turning away from this government. Let's not pretend. Let's not pretend otherwise. On the notion of a constitution itself, whilst I have no issue with a clearer statement of rights and protecting such important things as the right to strike, there are plenty of positive steps the government could take right now simply through their own actions. We can give people more power in their workplaces and communities with the powers available to us currently. So why is that not being pursued? Why is that not being pursued? Presiding officer, they do not need another mandate to implement these things. Jamie Hepburn and Angus Robertson are quick to tell us that they have a mandate to deliver a referendum on independence. But they, they are equally quick to forget the commitments to abolish council tax, to reduce primary class sizes, and who can forget, as we've heard before, the treatment guarantee. Only this SNP government can forget the treatment guarantee. They talk of a man, their talk of a mandate only suits them when it comes to independence, not delivering on the real priorities for the Scottish people. In short, the public want this government to deliver on what they have already secured votes for before they start constructing the next promise that they will break. I do not think it is too much to ask. All it takes is accepting the very obvious reality that it is this time that they, that they should appreciate um, those, the, what the communities of Scotland want. They are not looking for independence, and certainly at the moment, none of them are looking for another referendum. That's just the hard political reality that faces them. Presiding officer, a mature government would, involve, would, would consider accepting that point. It is not the time to discuss this paper. Thank you. And I call Keith Brown to be followed by Ross Greer. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. I was going to talk about the virtues, as I see them, of a written constitution, which many of my colleagues have done. But I think it's important for the Chamber to realise just exactly what it is that the opposition parties, all looking at their phones just now, actually support when they support the current unwritten constitution. So rather than quoting Dicey or Edmund Burke or Montesquieu or any of the thinkers that they would normally cite in defence of an unwritten constitution, it's just been a, a puerile attack on the SNP. I don't know how many times Neil Bibby mentioned the words SNP, for example, in his speech. But let's look at what they currently support. What do you get with an unwritten constitution? First of all, you get the proroguing of a parliament when it becomes inconvenient, actually just stopping parliament. Then you go and lie to the head of state about the proroguing of parliament. And proroguing of parliament, of course, stopped it working altogether. What they're doing here uh, in the empty benches that we see is walking away because they have no arguments to countenance uh, our uh, proposals for a, a written constitution. You also have the situation where you can make international agreements and then break them immediately once you've made them. Or it may only be in a specific and limited way, but you've just lied to people that you've made an agreement and you trash the reputation of the state that you support in the process of doing it. Or, of course, you can stuff to the gunnels the House of Lords, that paragon, that mother of parliaments, where you have 800-plus cronies of various political parties, Labour and Tory, ones that have donated to those parties, and you call that a democracy. It must be the only legislature in the world where the majority are unelected and yet not a word of condemnation from any of the parties in this parliament. And then, of course, you can lie to Parliament without a word being said on these benches about the liar himself, Boris Johnston. Not a word of condemnation uh, from those benches in this place. And, of course, for years we had the, the fiction that we had a separation of powers within the UK Parliament. Of course, you had a person in the name of the, the Lord Chancellor who was a member of the executive, the judiciary, as well as the legislature. The embodiment of the fact there was no separation of powers with all the attendant problems that that brought as well. But when you put all those flaws into the fact you have an unwritten constitution with the presence of the constitutional vandals that we see in Westminster just now, that's where you get some of the major breaches of that constitution. Uh, and that would have been much more difficult for those constitutional vandals to have done that had there been a written uh, constitution with protections for individuals and groups within society. Uh, but it's easy to do uh, that, to go through that constitution, that unwritten constitution, and make these breaches if you have this thin veneer of respectability of an unwritten constitution. And it's been a source of shame for many years to me, having studied political science, to see some people uh, 
put this up on a pedestal as some fantastic, almost mythical virtue of the UK state. It is anything but. It's also true, of course, it allows for democratic denial, a rewriting of what most people understand as the basic principles of democracy. If you win an election, you get to uh, implement your manifesto. That has been ditched. The idea of the mandate, a cornerstone of democracy, has been ditched by the people of the opposition parties in this chamber. And of course you have the devolution mess that we're seeing just now, whereby parties that simply don't like your party can change their mind, can act with caprice to make sure that you're uh, stopped in your legitimate aims from exercising devolved powers within the devolved settlements. And of course, before Labour get too comfortable, you can have illegal wars as well. That's one of the things that you can do, uh, consigning many people to deaths in those wars uh, at the same time as going straight past their normal democratic processes. And of course, the point Paul McLennan made, you can have an act of union which you can tell people is voluntary, but you just make sure there's no way you can exercise your rights to leave that union, even if that was a deal that you signed up to, of course, in the first place. So it's quite clear to see to me that the virtues of a written constitution, I think, will appeal. And despite what you say about fantasy, I think they'll appeal to the people of Scotland, not least because the curtain has been pulled back from the unwritten constitution. And I think a rights respecting Scotland, which looked after the rights of individuals in the way that we've heard, will prove to be very effective in making sure that people vote for independence for Scotland. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, President Officer. Independence is a, a worthy goal in and of itself. For Greens, we believe that bringing power closer to people is worthwhile. But we certainly believe, and I'm sure I know the SNP colleagues do as well, that we want these powers, the powers of independence, for a purpose. Because we believe that our nation can do, can achieve so much more with the powers of a normal independent nation. We can be fairer, greener and more democratic. And the process of establishing that new nation is a hugely exciting opportunity. It's an opportunity to discuss and to decide and to enshrine our founding values. Who do we aspire to be as a nation? And in Scotland, the sovereignty lies with the people, not with Parliament. That is a radical and an ancient tradition. And it's one that we'll honour with a process that allows the people to write the constitution, not just the politicians. Because too often for people across the UK, politics feels like something that's done to them, not something that we all do together. That is what Westminster is to me, a politics done to people. And an independent Scotland is our opportunity to do politics differently, to do politics together as a people. And for Greens, we see a huge opportunity in these fundamental questions of democracy, like who our head of state should be. We're told, of course, that the British monarchy is an appropriate head of state because it's neutral and doesn't interfere in our politics. But that's not the case. They're exempt from police searches. We can't search their properties for the loot of centuries of British imperialism. They're exempt from equalities legislation, so their staff can't take them to court if they're mistreated. They're exempted from inheritance tax. And, of course, now we have the ludicrous spectacle of the heir to the throne claiming to dedicate himself to ending homelessness whilst committing a fraction of what his family should have paid in tax to that cause. His dad claims that he's committed to tackling the climate crisis, but of course their family's lands in Scotland are exempt from various bits of climate legislation, like the Heat Networks Bill. An independent Scotland can follow the wave of Commonwealth nations who are switching to an elected head of state. We just need to look to our nearest neighbour in Ireland for an example of how astounding individuals can come forward for that position. Mary McAleese, Mary Robinson, the incumbent Michael D. Higgins, who I think gave possibly the greatest speech ever heard in this Absolutely. Parliament. Independence is about democracy above all else. We'll root our new nation in that principle from top to bottom. And we can enshrine the powers exercised at local level. This is not just about creating another sovereign parliament at, uh, like Westminster here at Holyrood. It's about empowering our communities as well. Because we need democratic renewal. We certainly need rid of the House of Lords. If it wasn't thoroughly discredited before this week, the revelations that MI5 officers had to warn Boris Johnson not to appoint Evgeny Lebedev to the Lords, only for him to ignore them, should surely destroy any credibility that that institution still has. And that was hardly the first scandal, whether it's cash for honours or the appointment of donors and hangers-on for decades and centuries. 
writing a constitution is an opportunity for us to be bold in guaranteeing the rights that are needed by people and by planet. We can enshrine the right to health care and protect the status of our NHS. We can enshrine the right to strike and to protest fundamental rights required for any group of people to genuinely be free, but which are under attack by the UK government right now. We have one party of government in the UK attacking those rights and the other party either supporting them or at best abstaining and committing not to repeal them once they've been passed. The people, through our constitution, will constrain the power of both Parliament and government in an independent Scotland. And Parliament's role in relation to government will be made clear. Major decisions like declarations of war should absolutely be passed by Parliament rather than through the executive power of a government. There are few uh, inequalities in Scotland, as long or unequal as the huge concentration of land ownership in very, very few hands. That's exactly the kind of issue that we could tackle with our constitution. We just need to look to international examples like in Brazil, whose constitution requires land and property to fulfil a social function. We could look at New Zealand's ban on nuclear weapons, uh, the Swiss model of direct democracy. There are so many inspiring examples, exciting examples of the kind of nation that an independent Scotland could be, and I'm excited for us to take the first steps on that journey. Thank you. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Conservative and Labour amendments allude to or promulgate the proposition that a written constitution is an abstract which displaces the real and current issues for the people of Scotland, the economy, cost of living crisis, free access to health care at the point of need, a warm, affordable home, a decent living wage, the right to withdraw your labour, to be free of weapons of mass destruction, to provide a sanctuary to those fleeing persecution. A written constitution is the framework, the foundation of a just society where human rights, the rights of our children, the rights especially of the vulnerable, the rights I have referred to, the rights of my constituents, will there any who's not here, are fundamental and protected. It is a contract with the people who of course are sovereign and have remained so despite the Union of 1707, and I quote, McCormack against the Lord Advocate, 1953, session case 396, on appeal to the Inner House, Lord President Cooper, obiter dictum, quotes, the principle of unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctively English principle. Reinstated in the claim of rights signed on 30th March 1989, quote, we gathered as the Scottish Constitutional Convention to hereby acknowledge the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited to their needs and do hereby declare and pledge that in all our action deliberations their interests shall be paramount. Yet the UK Parliament has placed what to all intents and purposes is a permanent veto on the Scots exercising their sovereign right through a referendum. I remind the unionists in here that in 2014 the Scottish people were told that to vote yes to independence, they'd be thrown out of the EU. We voted 62% remain, and we've been dragged out against our will. With no UK written constitution, Westminster has free reign to undermine and even erode basic human rights, especially for the vulnerable, the rape clause, the bedroom tax, providing a haven in Scotland for nuclear weapons, and for those seeking sanctuary, the irony, given its imperial past, of a reverse slave trade paying for the shipping of desperate migrants to Rwanda, whose own breach of human rights the UK has actually questioned. We in this parliament find that our protection of these rights is restricted and being eroded. And that is in the context not only of a majority in here with manifestos committed to an independent Scotland, but with a majority of Scottish MPs, 45 SNP to six Tory, one Labour, four Liberal Democrats. Independence with a written constitution means that no Scottish Parliament could unilaterally remove or amend the rights of the Scottish people embedded in that constitution. It would require the consent of the people who are sovereign. That is not what the Westminster Parliament is doing day in and day out. A constitution which is pragmatic in its implementation, giving rights and remedies to the people of Scotland should any Scottish government default. 
These are rights that are the stuff of fact, not fiction. Thank you. I call Morris Golden to be followed by Michael Mara. Presiding officer, of all the issues we could spend precious parliamentary time on, we are here today to debate the constitution of an independent Scotland. We could have spent today focusing on the NHS waiting time crisis, which includes the cancer treatment target that's been missed for almost a decade, or coming up with a plan to reduce Scotland's shockingly high drugs deaths, which the SNP are unable to get a grip of, or addressing falling educational standards and closing the attainment gap, which continues to widen under the SNP, or tackling violent crime, which is at its highest level since 2014, or tackling climate change, such as exploring how the SNP and Greens can stop missing their emissions targets, or how they can rescue their botched deposit return scheme. But instead of dealing with the real issues affecting people across Scotland, the SNP and Greens would rather use up the time of this chamber discussing their ever more convoluted independence fantasy. A fantasy constitution triggered by a fantasy independence referendum which triggers another fantasy referendum to adopt the fantasy constitution. And that's all this latest independence paper is. More fantasy released in time to placate the party faithful at the SNP's weekend conference on independence. But what isn't a fantasy is the 1.5 million a year that the Scottish Government are paying 24 civil servants in their constitutional futures division to work on these prospectus for independence papers and similar projects. No. Uh, up until recently, the First Minister suggested that these prospectus for independence papers were a waste of time. Happy to. Stuart McMillan. I thank Morris Gordon for taking the intervention. Would Morris Gordon be able to tell the Chamber how much the UK government spent uh, on civil servants to deal with Brexit? Morris Gordon. I am neither responsible for or accountable to the UK Government, but if the member would like to question the UK Government, there will be a general election coming up which the member may want to consider standing in. But the First Minister suggested that the prospectus for independence papers were a waste of time as they were being ignored by the general public. But according to the First Minister, it will be different with him because, of course, he wants to be known as the first activist and that it would be his job as First Minister to get these fantasy documents into the hands of activists, which begs a number of worrying questions. Does the member really think that this is the role the First Minister entails? And more alarmingly, how can it be appropriate to have 24 civil servants at a cost of £1.5 million a year producing documents to be used by SNP activists? Now, I know the 1.5 million may seem like a drop in the ocean when it comes to the hundreds of millions of pounds that this government wastes. But try explaining that to the families up and down the country who are struggling every day with the cost of living crisis. The SNP act as if they are alone. I need to make progress in the last 22 seconds. Uh, the SNP act if they alone know what's best for Scotland, but the Scottish people rejected independence in a free and fair referendum. Scotland told them no, and the SNP have never come to terms with that. Thank you. And I call Michael Mara to be followed by Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to state that an independent Scotland would have a written constitution is an exercise in stating the obvious. Uh, I have to say, I, I thought a, a very fine and eloquent speech when Christine Graham made that uh, very straightforward statement and turned it something into the more of the poetry of it. But new, no new state is now formed that does not develop and adopt a written constitution. 
So it is a statement of the obvious. And the lack of a codified constitution in the UK is a historical oddity and anomaly. It's maintained by institutions that have, in relative terms globally, been stable over centuries. So the debate that we have today, not on the moment, I'll get, uh, not, not right now, but I'll certainly come back to you. Um, the debate uh, that was brought today, uh, that there is uh, benefits to codification above flexibility, offers very little insight so far into the trade-offs between them. Uh, although I think uh, Keith Brown uh, also gave a good speech in, in that regard. I have to say it's not a debate that greatly animates me or my party. We are, and always have been, more animated by the delivery of social protection and progress rather than writing down those aspirations on parchment. No, I'm just getting started. Thank you. Um, so the, the paper in question suggests that the NHS be written into our constitution. But the reality of protecting our NHS will not be achieved in prose or by a plebiscite. As Bevan made clear, the NHS will last as long as there are folk left with faith to fight for it. It is a political question of the will and means to raise the resources and competent government to channel them appropriately. And it's this incompetent SNP government who have driven our NHS to its knees yep. and to the brink of collapse. Yep. Professionals who have dedicated their lives to our citizens through our NHS are now openly, openly asking whether it can survive. And as reported just this weekend in the Herald, they have 7,000 Scots awaiting treatment for more than two years compared to 600 in England, a country 11 times our size. There's been the complete failure of the NHS recovery plan, the longest waiting times ever, um, a, a plethora of waiting time guarantees that have been met. The SNP are making an unholy mess of protecting our NHS today. Instead, we're invited today to welcome its protection in a fictional document in some undetermined future. And that should be a worry to all of us. None of that addresses the fact that no comparable small nation has an NHS, that the weight of such committed expenditure is not normally borne by a more limited tax base. None of it recognises the immediate loss of over £10 billion in revenue in the event of secession, which we've been asked to believe would have no adverse effect upon our ability to retain and improve our NHS. None of it is recognising the cost of establishing a new state, building exchange reserves to defend a pegged currency for a foreign power, who would at that point be setting interest rates for our separate country. None of this is my proposition. It's this government's policy platform, which brings us to this weekend's headline performance at the Great Caird Hall in Dundee. The reviews are rolling in and they do not make for pretty reading. It is extraordinarily difficult for anyone to genuinely know what to make of the whole thing. SNP MPs included, apparently. Maybe it's just dreadful writing, they say. Surely it could not have been purposely ambiguous. Well, the First Minister is certainly trying to get good value out of his money for his new spin doctor. The First Minister appears to be telling the country that independence can be decided by 33% of the votes taking Nicola Sturgeon's widely discredited proposal and going even further. Now, will the vote be monitored by a slightly smaller independence thermometer? Ash Regan might let us know. It's not a serious plan. But that's no surprise, because he's not a serious First Minister. He's attempting to reframe an election and manage party expectations in a desperate attempt to hold on to his job. Presiding officer, all of this at a time of NHS distress, cost of living crisis and mortgage rate meltdown. Would that we could talk about all of this instead. Thank you. And I call Karen Adam, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. In preparation for this debate today, I've been reading the words of James Madison, who was the father of the Constitution of the United States of America. And there was one quote in particular that really struck me, and I'd like to share it with the Chamber. He said, The people are the only legitimate fountain of power, and it is from them that the constitutional charter under which the several branches of government hold their power is derived. For centuries here in Scotland, sovereignty is said to lie with the people, and so it should come as no surprise that such an absolute should be instilled within James Madison because he was educated by a Scot, a tutor, Donald Robertson. When the United States of America declared independence from the United Kingdom, among the first lines of the Declaration of Independence were the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. When Scotland regains her independence, we too should put equality, 
not only for men, though, I might add, in the opening lines of our written constitution. The Declaration of Independence goes on to say, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And in the list of facts, the document outlines why independence is needed. Of the then leader of the United Kingdom, it says, he has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. <coughs> he has dissolved representative houses repeatedly. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people will relinquish the right of representation in the legislature. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. Now, does this sound familiar to anyone? Since 1939, 62 countries have become independent from the United Kingdom, and to date, none of them have asked to return. The near totality of those countries has codified constitutions. It took three centuries for Scotland to regain her parliament and just a few short decades for the UK government to overrule and undermine it. The UK is an outlier without a written constitution, and while the Scottish government is enshrining rights, the UK government is trying to take them away. The first line of Scotland's interim constitution should make clear Scotland is an independent country in which the people are sovereign. Never again should power so far, both geographically and democratically, from the people of Scotland be able to undermine our sovereign will. The publication of Creating a Modern Constitution for an Independent Scotland, it lays out a vision for our constitutional future. It's a vision that embraces the principles of democracy, human rights and the sovereignty of the people. It is a document that reflects the aspirations and the values of our nation. In recent years, we have witnessed a per persistence from the UK government and the Conservative Party as a whole in restricting the democratic will of the Scottish people. Time and time again, our voices have been undermined and our choices disregarded. The power imbalance is evident, with decisions that directly affect Scotland being made without our consent or our consideration. Now, these are just a few ideas um, that I have close to my heart in the Constitution, protecting the right for workers and, and protecting the NHS, which would be free at the point of use. And I want to go on and finish my remarks today, presiding officer, that um, with a plea, really, to Scots across the country to dwell on and articulate our vision for Scotland. We don't just have to imagine a better country. This is not fantasy. We can build it. Don't let anyone think that you cannot. A written constitution is precisely the opportunity to create the foundation of a society where every citizen is valued, where rights are protected and where the interests of the people take precedence over narrow political considerations. And as I heard I across the chamber, I heard across the chamber, presiding officer, that aren't we looking at the wolves at the door? Absolutely, but I don't know about MDLs. I am fed up with the wolves at the door. Let's stop the wolves of Westminster coming to Scotland Thank and you, Ms. Adam. be independent. We now move to closing speeches, and I call on Foyzel Chowdhury. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, this debate today could have been used to debate the uh, crisis in our NHS and how children are having to wait months for routine medical tests, or to help students who are threatened with homelessness due to rising energy costs and housing supply. We would have been discussing much needed education reform or local government budget cuts. Instead, we are here today to debate independence. Yet again, this document brings nothing new to the table. In fact, it is the fourth of its kind. Presiding officer, the SNP have said time and time again that no, uh, the devolution is being undermined in Scotland, when in fact devolution is being uh, trumped by two governments who refuses to work together. It is uh, being under, uh, undermined by the Tories in Westminster and the SNP here in Holyrood refusing to communicate and cooperate. While the two governments cannot reach an agreement, 
Scotland suffers. This government should be spending this time with the real problems facing Scotland. There could be, no, uh, there could be uh, tackling waiting times in the NHS, helping the people of Scotland pay their bills, or addressing social and health inequalities in Scotland. But as Willie Ray, Rainey mentioned, the SNP don't want to face the hard reality of the issues facing the people in Scotland. That is why, as Sharon Dowie pointed out, we often struggle to see ministers in the chamber to address uh, these issues. Instead, the SNPs are doubling down in the politics, uh, politics of division. Scottish Labour's constitutional uh, offer will see devolution strengthened, uh, not weakened or undermined. It would ensure the government focus on the principle that power should be uh, based as uh, near as possible to the place in which it is uh, exercised. It would focus on moving power into the hands of local authorities and communities. Neil Bibby spoke of the six billion pound in cuts to local governments. Scottish Labour would ensure fairer funding for local communities. This is the reality that Scottish Labour are offering. Not an ideological uh, pipe dream of independence, one which there is a little more support uh, for them in 2014. I've got a long list to go to. Presiding officer, Scotland is not a colony. At the SNP conference at the weekend, Mary Black, MP, referred Scotland becoming the 63rd country to gain independence from the UK. The rhetoric following an SNP MP last year uh, commenting in the chamber that it, it was beyond belief that Labour MSP would support a motion celebrating Indian independence but not Scottish independence. Presiding officer, uh, in Kenya, during Mau uh, uh, uprising in 1952, there were widespread reports of uh, detention camps, torture, sexual assault, and brutal bodily harm. During the colonial rule in India in 1919, uh, the Amritsar massacre saw protester against colonial rule blocked inside a walled garden and fired upon until the guns ran out of ammunition. British rules also saw widespread famine and poverty. In 1943, up to four million Bengalis uh, starved to death while millions of tons of uh, wheat were exported in Britain. Are we actually uh, comparing this Scotland relationship in the UK? No, sorry, no. This, 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 this countries, these countries were fighting for independence from Scotland. To, to, to even try to compare the experience of British rule in these countries to Scotland relationship with the rest of the UK is insulting. We must, we must stop the rhetoric of Scotland as a colony yeah. and actually address the legacy of Scotland as a colonizer. That's why you're not winning. In closing, presiding officer, as the SNP talk to themselves about themselves, as they hide behind the ill-founded arguments, as they continue to fail make the case for independence, never are focused on strengthening devolution and being the change that Scotland needs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Jackson Carlow. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I suppose this afternoon's debate fits neatly into the traditional BBC summer schedule of repeats. And I do apologise in advance. Unfortunately, I'm suffering from a chronic migraine this afternoon. So while I can see you, I can't actually see anybody else in the chamber. You're all just in a fog there, but uh, I hope you'll take that into account. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I, um, 
attended an event at uh, a local primary school in my constituency, Eagleson Primary, who had got into partnership with Scottish Opera and had put on a marvellous production. The kids were in fantastic costumes, they were singing. It was altogether more coherent, joyful, original and better rehearsed than any speech I heard from those advocating this motion this afternoon. When, when, I mean, I understand the importance uh, of the games industry to Scotland. I've never played one, but my sons, when they were younger, used to play something called The Sims. And in The Sims, you were able to construct this completely artificial little world in your, in your own head. You built buildings and put in uh, police stations and, and wrote constitutions. I never expected... I never expect, uh, Mr. Mr. Robertson knows more about it than I do, obviously. It has a, it's inspired him for his contribution today. But I never expected a video game to be the hallmark and centre of Scottish government policy. And Mr. Robertson, who is indulging in this fantasy, uh, and I, what I suppose must be regarded as the high watermark of his contribution to public office, has otherwise written some really rather nice books. He wrote an excellent book on, on Vienna, which I, I commend other people to read. He would be far better applying himself to that task than to the ridiculous nonsense and fantasy that he's brought before this chamber this afternoon. And I don't know how many of the SNP members or Green members sitting behind him this afternoon were here in the 2007 Parliament, a smattering perhaps. That actually, that government led by Alex Salmon, with no record to defend, was actually quite impressive. And of course, in the 2011 election, it won an absolute majority. And it won a right to fight an, a referendum on Scottish independence. It fought that referendum. It lost that referendum. With the highest turnout in any public vote that there has ever been in any contest at any time, in the entire history of the United Kingdom. I will in just a second. At any time in the United Kingdom, and in no election since, has the separatist movement come close to achieving anything like the poll in favour of independence it achieved then. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful for uh, Jackson Carlo taking an intervention. I intervened on his front bench colleague earlier to ask what the position of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party is in relation to Scotland being able to make a decision about its democratic future. He failed to answer that. Could Jackson Carlo tell the Chamber what do Scots need to do to be able to secure a vote on their own independent future? Jackson Carlo. Not a speech, Mr Robertson. In that referendum that you lost in 2014, that the, the, the separatists lost in 2014, they said it would be a once-in-a-generation event. And what surprises me genuinely is that in the years since, there has been no attempt whatsoever from the SNP to define what a generation is and when another referendum might reasonably Let's take hear place. Mr. Carlo. Some... Pardon? Sorry, presiding officer. I was calling for quiet so oh, that we might hear you, Mr. Carlo. Some people have defined it as 25 years. Some have defined it as 40. By the end of this parliament... We will, be, we will be 12 years, we will be 12 years from the date of the last referendum. Surely a far better purpose in engaging on the future of Scotland's constitutional future would have been to work with others to say when might another referendum reasonably take place. If it was two parliaments before now, two parliaments from now, we will have covered that 25 years. But no, instead of... I, I, Mr Brown, I think you and I had all this out in a television programme once, and I'm afraid you failed lamentably. And I happen to notice, since you accused others of what, uh, looking at their phones, you've done nothing but look at your own phone ever since this afternoon, which is <laughs> deeply ironic. We've also had from Christine Gray talk about the European Union and it's true I was one of those who voted to remain Scotland did vote to remain in the EU referendum in 2016 and that has been trumpeted by the SNP it hasn't changed the opinion polls in favour of independence Mr Brown likes to pop to his feet and sometimes not even from his feet talk about Liz Trust and the dreadful economic catastrophe as he sees it brought about by the government last year. It was certainly an inglorious period in the history of Conservative government. That hasn't changed the opinion polls in favour of Scottish independence. Nothing has changed the opinion polls in favour of Scottish independence. So when Nicola Sturgeon 
said on television repeatedly after that referendum that she would not call for another one until there was a sustained, substantial and consistent majority in opinion polls in favour of independence, it's never happened. And instead, we have this wheeze, a little backroom exercise in how can we keep the conversation on independence alive? What can we pretend to say differently? When instead, as others have said, the real issue is no, no constituent of mine in Eastwood has ever knocked on my door and said, Mr. Carlo, what I want is a new constitution to be thought up for an imaginary post-independent Scotland. What they have said to me is, why is it four years before I can get my gallbladder operation when 20 years ago when I had mine it was four months? Why is it that they can't get a ferry to and from the Isle of Arran? Why is it the schools are unable to actually provide qualifications and an education of a standard that we saw before this government came to office? Why is it the firefighters are queuing up complaining about this SNP government, those are the issues. And Sharon Dow was quite right. In the debates that we have on those issues in this parliament, the SNP benches are largely empty. But where are they today? Absolutely, yes. We'll turn out to discuss the real issues of Let's hear Scotland Mr. Carlo. when the SNP turn out to discuss nothing but fantasy instead. And then, at the climax of it all, we heard from that would-be international revisionist historian, Ross Greer, with his usual backdoor attack on the monarchy. Let me just say to him and to the SNP serried ranks beside him, the majority of people in this country, I am confident, look forward to the reign of King Charles III, King William IV, and long after we are all dead and gone, the reign of King George VII. Let me conclude, presiding officer, with two simple statements which sum up the mood of the unionist majority in this country. Advance Britannia. God save the King. Thank you. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to wind up the debate. Up to nine minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, I don't intend to make the uh, monarchy the central focus of my contribution today. But I did notice a little discomfort from Mr Cameron in the uh, ovation for the current uh, monarchy. Mr Cameron understands his family history. I think it might be for Mr Carlo to read the history of the Cameron family to understand the reference I was making there. But to uh, the debate uh, at hand, can I thank members for their uh, contributions? Can I thank, begin by thanking Mr Rennie, who confirmed what many of us have long suspected that in advance of debates we have in this place, he undertakes no form of reading or research to inform <laughs> yeah, his yeah. Uh, contribution. Yeah. Uh, Fausal Chowdhury, can I respond to his contribution? Um, the cases that he laid out in terms of the historical experiences of those countries that were colonised by the United Kingdom do not bear any contrast with the modern Scotland in which we live yeah, yeah. here and now. No one in these benches would have the insensitivity to suggest there is no chance in giving way to you, Mr Chowdhury, you did not give way once. There is no one in these benches that would make such an insensitive comparison, but surely that is not the standard by which any country yeah, yeah. has to go through to yeah, yeah, determine yeah, yeah. whether or not it should become yeah, yeah. an independent country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me uh, begin with some of the critique that has been Mr. Hepburn, uh, sorry, I'm just um, conscious of, of some echo. Could I ask you just to direct your microphone um, just over to yourself? Thank you. I wasn't conscious it wasn't directed towards myself, but hopefully it is better directed. Uh, now, let me direct my uh, remarks to uh, the Chamber, uh, President Officer, uh, starting with the critique around having the debate. The first critique was that we shouldn't be having it at all. This isn't somehow important. Well, I would remind members that the, this Scottish Government has secured a mandate through the 2021 election. We stood in that election on the basis of seeking to advance the independence yeah. case. We won that election. And Mr Cameron suggested that we should read the room in the context of what we should debate. I would rather suggest he should look around this room and look who constitutes the members of this chamber. Yeah. His party is in the minority. Yeah. This party is in government and has every right to advance yeah, yeah, uh, this yeah. uh, case. Yeah. The, the, the second uh, point uh, is that it, it's perfectly legitimate. I think it's necessary that we should have brought forward uh, this debate. Uh, Mr Cameron uh, was suggesting that we didn't announce the publication of this document to Parliament. We did. We answered the government-inspired question, 
and I wrote to the relevant committee conveners, and now we have brought forward a debate on this government yeah, yeah. paper to enable Parliament to try and hold this government to account. Yeah, yeah. I take that uh, 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 matter very seriously indeed. And I have to find, say I find it odd that we hear from other benches routinely, wrongly and accurately, that we do not open ourselves up to accountability. Then when we seek to do it, we're criticised for doing it in the first place. Yeah, yeah. The third point I want to uh, talk about is... Uh, the idea that we're not concentrating on the priorities of the people of Scotland. This is a government that, through its policies, has lifted 90,000 children yeah. out of yeah. poverty. This is a government, yeah. over the course of its lifetime, that has built 122,000 affordable homes. Yeah. This is a government that has put in place a just transition fund to help people move into the opportunities in the renewable energy sector. This is a government that has tripled the fuel and security fund. This is a government that has promoted the real living wage, which sees its working age population that ha paid uh, the highest percentage of its uh, population of any uh, UK country paid at least this uh, level. And this is a government that is mitigating against the Tory bedroom tax. Yeah. That is some of what this Scottish government has done, and it is a nonsense to suggest that we are not focused on the people's yeah, needs. Yeah, and yeah, Donald yeah. Cameron... Donald Cameron is mistaken if he thinks that we are directing attention away from our record in government, as his uh, amendment suggests. But let's focus on his party's record in government. And I thought it was telling that Carol Mockin talked about the wolf at the door. Let's talk about the wolf at the door. Let's talk about a UK government that is attempting to roll back the Human Rights Act. Rights Act. Let's talk about a Tory government that's put in place its Pernicious Trade Union Act. Let's talk about a Tory government that's taken forward the creeping privatisation of our National Health Service. Let's talk about a Tory government with a draconian approach to asylum policy. Yeah. Uh, all of this is happening in the real world that Mr Bibby uh, spoke of, but he appears to be letting it uh, pass him by. And it is all made possible because of the UK government's uncodified constitution, which is anachronistic, yeah, yeah. Uh, is an outlier, as Karen uh, Adam uh, suggested, because it enables the sovereignty of Parliament. The UK Government is able to pursue this agenda unfettered because it is able to do so under the precepts of uh, the uh, primacy of the concept of so sovereignty of uh, Parliament. Uh, in terms of uh, where we are, though, uh, and the contrast of our pr proposition, we want to see Mr Bibby was kind enough, unlike other members, to let me intervene. Of course I'll give way. Neil Bibby. Minister for taking the intervention. You mentioned frequent privatisation in the UK. We've seen more and more people having to go private for NHS treatment in Scotland. 500,000 people have been failed by the treatment time guarantee. Why is that happening in Scotland under the SNP? Minister. No one is suggesting for a moment that there are not challenges in the National Health Service. And of course, the Health Secretary is uh, pursuing an agenda to make sure we can rebuild back from the challenges we've seen in COVID. But in terms of the fundamental proposition that we should have a health service free at the point of need, that is something we believe in, and that is something that is under attack from those uh, benches over there, and it is something that the uh, Labour Party should have its eyes uh, open to. And this is how we can best defend uh, that principle, and it is one of the propositions that we have, is having a written codified constitution which have a constitutional right to a system of health care free at the point of need. In a written constitution, a codified constitution, perfectly normal, oh, the, the overwhelming majority of countries in the world have such a written codified constitution. Indeed, it's less than 10 countries without of which the United Kingdom is one. But there are other rights that we can secure. In a written constitution, we could put some of the fundamental human rights laid out in the European Convention on uh, Human uh, Rights into that uh, constitution. Unlike the UK government abolishing the Human Rights Act, we could put in place the U United Nations uh, Charter of the Rights of Children. We heard earlier today a statement uh, from Shirley Ann Somerville showing some of the limitations we have faced mm -hmm. in being able to put that into legislation. We could have a, a, in our constitution a right to an adequate standard of living. Contrast that with research published just yesterday by the Institute for Fiscal Studies that shows uh, while housing benefit has remained frozen since 2020, uh, rents have gone uh, upwards with only 120 private rental properties uh, advertised in Zoopla now able to be covered by housing uh, benefit. That's hardly speaking to an adequate standard of living. And of course, uh, we would ensure that workers' rights were in our codified written uh, constitution. 
That is core to the approach we would take. And in that sense, the notion that this is hypothetical or abstract is frankly a nonsense. It matters mm -hmm. because it is not, as has been suggested, an exercise in playing games, as was suggested by Mr Carlaw. What we are absolutely no chance in giving away to Mr Mara. Mr Mara pretended he would let people intervene yeah, yeah. and then didn't take a single yeah, intervention. Yeah. No chance, Mr yeah, Mara. Yeah. We saw that. We saw what that. we are seeing is the casual erosion of rights and the narrowing of the scope of devolution under the current constitutional assessment. This is why it matters. We should have a written constitution where rights cannot be overturned on the whim of any government at any given point in time. Donald Cameron and Neil Bibby and others were wrong then to suggest, as their amendments do, that this is um, uh, academic or uh, theoretical. This is about a vision, it's about ambition, and we aim to turn it into a reality. Yeah, and I have yeah. to say, it was, t I mean, at least Mr. Mara accepted that the UK is anachronistic in not having a written constitution. It's just anomalous, he says. OK, well, anomalous, anachronistic, you know, potato, potato. <laughs> let's, just, let's just focus <laughs> on that. He didn't give any single commitment to change that state of arrangements. And when I put the point to Mr Bibby, he utterly yeah, yeah. dodged the question. Yeah, yeah. It's clear the Labour Party do not support the codification of people's rights in any way. Contrast that with Helena Kennedy of the Labour Party, who said that people going to work and creating a written constitution for an independent Scotland, definitely, I would do it now if I were in that camp. And Let's I have hear to say, Mr. Hepburn. I thought the response from Mr Bibby was rather a meagre when he talked about, well, the way to deal with this is change the government. When we have a Labour Party that's U-turning and flip-flopping on various pledges such as abolishing tuition fees in England, on Brexit, or when we have Keir Starmer saying that the Labour Party are the real Conservatives, that doesn't really sound much of a change of government to me. The real change is securing independence and, in this case, having a written constitution. And we want to do that with the participation of the people of Scotland. We fundamentally trust the people of Scotland, unlike uh, those on the other benches in this place. We want to engage uh, the population to make sure that, first of all, we can have an interim constitution from day one of independence, but thereafter create a convention representative of the people of Scotland to bring back a proposition to the people of Scotland. No, I am afraid I will not be giving way uh, to you, Mr Johnson. You didn't take part in uh, the debate. Even you weren't here. Uh, we would create a constitutional uh, convention to make sure that the people of this country can have their say. I trust them. They can come back uh, and we would put that to the people of the country. Uh, so let me uh, close. The Cabinet Secretary opened this debate by talking about the rhetorical power of an ambitious constitution. And he was right to do so. Uh, I recognise that it takes more than just a written constitution to secure good government or to protect and advance people's rights. A written constitution is necessary, but not sufficient. It also requires the right culture, and it takes commitment. After all, the world is full of countries with written constitutions whose governments and way of governing fail to live up to their ideals. But I am uh, convinced that we have what it takes to embrace a new constitution. And I am convinced that Scotland needs one if it's to embrace fully the opportunities of independence. We already have strong, highly trusted institutions. We have a Scottish government and have shown over 25 years of devolution through coalition, minority, majority and cooperation models government that we are innovative and responsive. We have a government that, according to the Sc Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, three times as many people in Scotland trust to act in Scotland's best interest than they trust the UK government to do so. We have a parliament elected through a fair system of proportional representation. We have an independent just judiciary. We have public bodies like Social Security in Scotland. We have the underpinning things that we need to be an independent state. What we don't have is a written constitution that enables that lot over there to attack our rights. And that lot over Please there conclude, Minister. absolutely nothing. We trust the people of Scotland. I know what future appeals to me. It's an independent Scotland with a written constitution. That concludes the debate on building a new Scotland, the constitution of an independent country. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 9709 in the name of Richard Lockhead.
on Electronic Trade Documents Bill UK legislation. And I call on Richard Lockhead to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9746 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion, and the question is that motion 9746 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed, and there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that motion 9710, in the name of Emma Roddick, on Illegal Migration Bill UK legislation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and members well there will be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting system.